Um, so I thought to finish off, it's Easter Christmas, um, to tell you about the Cuttle Tree. And hopefully this will inspire you to have your own electronic Christmas tree decorations. Um, and it was kicked off by the Limington Christmas Tree Festival, which is held in the very same church that Peter Salisbury was talking about earlier. I think he even used this uh, uh, one of the images from this year's uh, Christmas Tree Festival. But it's been going on for some years. Our office used to be next door to the church, so it was very hard for us to say no when we were invited to take part. And we thought we wanted to show off what we did. So some of you will remember the cuttlefish. This is designed in PC Mod E by Sar Drimmer um, for us, and it's a solve it yourself Arduino board intended to encourage people to develop their solving skills in, a, in an entertaining way. Um, and we also had the seahorse. And this was a second attempt at something with Sar Drimmer. And this is very much aimed at wearable electronics and it's designed to be gender neutral. Um, so we have these two circuit boards and we've got quite a large number of them in drawers in the office. And we thought, let's put them to good use. So we thought, what do we want for Christmas decorations? And we thought lots of flashing lights in nice patterns. So we modified the cuttlefish. We didn't want lots of circuit boards and everything. So it was, you know, breadboards to plug it in. So instead of having pins to plug this in the breadboard, and if you, just to show you, we do have them. There's one I've got sitting on my desk. Um, we thought we'll solder the LEDs direct on. We don't want a programming header. We're not going to program it on the fly. We'll pre-program the chips and push them in the socket. And so we'll so we'll, we'll we'll connect LEDs. And to make it easy, rather typically you'll connect an LED between a signal pin and either ground or or power. Um, but what we did here was we connected occasionally when uh, there was a signal pin next to uh, ground or power, we could do that. But mostly we connected pairs of signal pins. So to flash the LED, you'd have to drive uh, the cathode low and the anode high. Um, but that's fine. And in this case, we've got red LEDs. Those are actually green LEDs. It's just their clear caps on them. OK, and we don't bother with the new art, new art header. And we, you can see the red and green wires at the top directly soldered in. Um, and similarly modified the seahorse. It's designed to have a, uh, a coin, so we don't need that. We're going to power it from the, the five volt. Um, and we put lots of little where we put thread attachments for for sewing, we, we put LEDs in there as well. The same general idea. Okay. So um, all the code we put on those is on the um, on, on GitHub and it's very simple. Most of the code is common. Um, then we've got some specializations really to deal with the different orders of pins um, on, the, on the different boards. Uh, and that's all that's custom the boards because the numbering of the pins around the seahorse and the cuttlefish is different. So in terms of the LEDs, um, we wanted a way of documenting each LED. And remember, because the LEDs aren't you know, tied to high or to, to ground or, 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 or logical high, um, we need to know whether they need to be driven low or high to turn on and off. And I appreciate we could have just had one of on or off and the other being the inverse, but it was convenient to do both. OK. And then where we have LEDs that are not connected to uh, you know, power or, or, or ground, we need to know which the other end is so we can drive it low or high as appropriate to form the circuit. Mm -hmm. And so we have a vector listing the pins that have to be either always driven high, or always driven low. OK. And that means that for the cuttlefish, we can list the LEDs we've got um, um, and what color they are and how to, what you need, what signal you need to drive to turn them on and turn them off. Secondly, we have a number of patterns. We can you know, circulate clockwise, anti-clockwise. We can fade up and down. We can flash and so forth. And what we do is we're going to allow eventually the user to select which pattern they can have. So what we have is we just have a structure that says each pattern is represented by a function and a parameter. OK, and typically that parameter might be how fast your lights are flashing around the loop or which direction they're flashing in. So we can reduce the number of functions by using an argument to parameterize them. 
And then we have a vector of functions in the common code. Okay. And so here's a light pattern example. And the way you control brightness on some Arduino stuff is by flashing the light on and off, very, the LED on and off very fast, and just controlling the mark space ratio between on and off. And in this case, it's a sinusoidal fading. So we have a loop. Um, we parameterize it by how many slices we go around the, the sine wave each time to control how fast we fade and rise. So that's the argument. And then we turn all the lights on. We delay for a period that's a sine function on the, the count of the loop. And then we flip them the other way around. We delay for sine function and then we turn them all off. And that gives us a fade, a fade an alternating fade effect. And we've got functions like that for assorted different ones there. And you can look in the code for them. And then lastly, we have the main program. This is common to both. And the idea for this is, this wasn't in 2017, but when we, this is the code from 2018, when we actually had a, a Raspberry Pi connected to the internet and using the serial line to, send, to tell each device what, um, what's, what, what pattern to run. I'm not going to go into the Raspberry Pi control today because um, I want to keep this talk short. Um, uh, but if there is something, we can use that to change the number of patterns. If we don't have that, we could just randomly select that. So that's the code. We have to wire it all up. We got ended up with twisting a lot of um, yeah, a green and red wires together to give us, because we need to get pound of ground ground and power to each device on the tree. Um, and we ended up with a nice little jig with a drill and stretching down the corridor to twist lots of wire together very fast. So there you can see, I think we had a total of seven cuttlefishes. We also had a, a number of um, seahorses wired up. And we then, well, we need to get power to them and we weren't going to put a five volt power supply, A, because we'd run out of plug sockets, and B, because we didn't want to really buy dozens of power supplies. So we found very useful little uh, micro USB breakout boards, and we could mount those on a piece of um, strip board and then run loads and loads of five volt um, off one power supply. And of course, these LEDs use no power at all. I mean, I think the whole thing uses, the whole circuit board uses 40 milliamps or something. And so you could run quite a few of those off a Raspberry power, Pi power supply. So we used little breakout boards and you'll see in a moment we put it in a 3D printed box. OK, and because we've got a 3D printer, we print we 3D printed a number of non-electronic decorations. I haven't got the box because I'm not in the office at the moment because we've been you know, we're working from home now. I haven't got the box of decorations, so I only have one at home and there's a photograph of it. Um, and. When we came to do the next year, we used a Raspberry Pi control. And the only thing to note is then, of course, we didn't need to just send power to each um, device. We also needed to send uh, the serial lines. So we ended up with four wire instead of two wire. And then we put it all together. So this is the back of the church, which you saw on the earlier video. And we started off all Christmas trees must have some plain lights. I think we got given them free. When we entered, you get a tree and a basic set of lights. So that's what we did. And then we started hanging on the various uh, little cuttlefish and, and seahorses and some other 3D printed decorations and some little um, uh, Linux penguins, Tux penguins uh, printed out on card um, to make it look nice. And you can see at the bottom there, a you know, power block with some Raspberry Pi power supplies in. Okay. And there, there's the block. So we actually had little 3D printed um, uh, we had three of those micro USB breakout boards capable of running all, all, all the massive cabling and wiring. And, and that gave us everything uh, we wanted. So we ran with three Raspberry Pi power supplies. And there on the right, you see the almost finished Christmas tree. But one thing you need on a Christmas tree is, oh, let me show you. So here's some close up. Let's just show you the seahorse. Now, I wasn't sure I could get an animation to work properly uh, 
on here. So what I've got is I've got six slides in close succession where I did a rapid take with the camera of one after the other. So you hopefully will get the idea of the lights change. It doesn't work terribly well, I realise I'm busy button. But anyway, we have got videos, but I couldn't embed them easily. So the other thing we needed was a Christmas star. So we 3D printed the idea of a Christmas star, and the idea was we'd put a cuttlefish on it. That's the cutout on the top. And then we'd space it a bit, and then we'd put some LEDs in inside. The LED holes aren't showing on this rendering here, but there are little LED holes all over, as will become clear when we look at it. So there's what we put it together. There's the Raspberry Pi mounted with some little blue and white, uh, blue and green or red LEDs, not quite sure what colour. And then we pull the wires through. And all we've got to do is wire them all up together and put the other side on. And that turns out to be incredibly fiddly. And you can see me there bent over for it took ages to get this to go together. And you can see it, I even got our first speaker to come and assist on that. So that was two of us trying to get it working. But eventually we did get it working. Um, there's Simon Cook, who some of you know, my engineering manager, um, helping me put the last bit in and finally up the step ladder and on the top of the ladder, on the top of the tree it goes. OK, and there it is. The complete cuttle tree, complete with flashing lights. It's hard in the still to give you quite the impression, but we were placed by the entrance. So we were the showcase tree as you came in. And that was very, uh, and it was widely appreciated. And we did it the following year, got even more exciting. You could tweak the tree and tell it what pattern you wanted. So um, that's all of this, the end of my talk. Um, with this exhibit, when, when the festival's over, it only lasts a few days, you get to take the tree back to the office. So there's, Ed Jones and I walking the tree back to the office. We really are next door. And that's where we discovered booking the biggest tree available wasn't a good idea because we had to lift the roots hard to fit it in. Um, but there it is. I leave you. Thank you. Happy Christmas. And there's the cuttle tree. And all the software is available to, for you to use. <laughs>